Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. At last, wheat harvest is in full swing across Oklahoma. As of midweek, the Oklahoma Wheat Commission reports that combines are rolling throughout the state, from the Texas border all the way north to the Kansas border. Those harvest reports are updated often. We have a link for you to check them out at sunup.okstate.edu. As we've talked about, many producers had a delayed start to this year's harvest. Today, SUNUP's Ed Barron takes us to Caddo County to a farm where they are glad to finally be cutting wheat. It's a hot, humid Oklahoma day, but Brian Vale is finally harvesting his wheat crop. We're probably a good week, week and a half later than we normally start because of the weather, the rains. That's on top of the conditions during the growing season. Yeah, it's been a pretty extreme year as far as the weather. That cold spell we had in February, I, that, I think that really hurt the wheat a little bit. And then, of course, the late freeze in April. It's been probably two or three in the afternoon before we can get started real good. It's kind of spotty here and there, but it's overall, it's pretty good. Despite the weather, it hasn't dampened the Vale family spirits. It's good quality what we're getting. It's good heavy, heavy 64 pound wheat, 65. The moisture's just really getting dry enough to take it to town. We're just gonna have to get used to those, I guess. It seems like it's happening more often than not. And it, it's definitely got some freeze damage this year. Across Oklahoma, many producers like Brian have had to deal with a delayed harvest. But with combines now rolling across the plains, things are beginning to heat up. Yeah, everybody kind of gets fired up for wheat harvest. It's just kind of a tradition, you know. We don't get as excited about cutting milo or soybeans or whatever else we're harvesting. Wheat harvest is just kind of a big deal. In the Vale family has been harvesting wheat for a long time. My dad, my granddad, my great granddad started farming in this area. So I'm like a fourth generation farmer. But for exactly how long is up for debate. I guess you might say there's six generations of us. I'm pretty fortunate I got two sons helping me. One's on that combine, another one's running the grain cart. Got a nephew that's driving trucks for us. My dad helps when we get behind. So yeah, it's a pretty family involved deal. Whenever I was just a little boy, they had an old drag combine that they pulled with a tractor and uh, they drug it out of the weeds about harvest time and hooked her up and you run the you run the header with a big old lever, you know, and this changed so much, I don't hardly get in them anymore, I know that. The life of a farmer is defined by change. Whether it's the change of the seasons, the climate, or the crops, the only thing that's consistent is change. I started no-tilling my stuff about 20 years ago, and so then we started rotating crops, growing more summer crops, more diverse cropping systems, you know, and that kind of, was it enabled me to clean up my fields and have cleaner wheat fields. You know, I'd, I'd like to see it go on, keep it going, that's for sure. And uh, it looks like we're gonna have some grandsons that's interested maybe in farming and kind of keeping things going. So I think it'll go for several years. Until then, Brian and his family will keep farming wheat and continue to challenge the elements. Well, it's just part of it and you just, depending on mother nature to do her part and cut you some slack you're always at her mercy we usually bump bump our way through it and if this crop you know if a wheat crop fails we go in here and plant a summer crop right behind it just no-till it in and hope hope it works and usually something will work <laughs> in cattle county i'm ed barron well, what I am seeing is that i'm very excited that we are finally being able to cut some wheat so southwest Oklahoma, we are seeing some uh, combines rolling, uh, second week of June. And just now that we are able to start cutting our plots, uh, yields are looking good, um, ranging from 30 to 65 bushels an acre in southwest Oklahoma in our plots. And also that's what I'm also hearing uh, from people. Test weight has been good. Some locations that wheat was not, you know, that was ready, but not able to be harvested earlier because of the, of the wet ground and the rain. Test weight declined a little bit, but not much. It's still good. It's still seeing test weight in the 60s, 62s, and sometimes even 64, 65. So it's, everything is looking good and we're making progress. Another thing that I wanted to say is that some people might be seeing uh, dark heads in wheat fields 
and that moisture that wet conditions those cool wet conditions that we had in the past weeks th those may have made a very ideal conditions for some fungus to start developing in wheat heads so that condition is called suvi mold so basically what we are seeing on the wheat heads right now it's it, it looks like you just saw some charcoal on it and those are caused by this fun this fungi that is called suvi mold and we're seeing up in the head and you know my recommendation is that for producers that are planning to use their wheat for seed and if they're harvesting wheat with a lot of those suvi molds for them to considering uh, treating their seeds before uh, planting because those will affect germination and possibly the seedling of wheat but yeah uh, yields are, are still good fast weight is still good so exciting times Hi, Wes Lee with the weekly Mesonet Weather Report. Summer doesn't officially start until next week, but that has not kept summer heat from arriving early. A heat wave is defined as a prolonged period of abnormally high temperature. While we haven't quite met that description yet, we are flirting with it. This chart is a number of days so far this year when temperatures exceeded 90 degrees. As usual, the West dominates this picture. On Tuesday afternoon, we had 90 statewide along with a couple of hundreds at Alva and Fairview. The temperature alone doesn't fully explain how it feels when you must work outside. Temperature adjusted with humidity gives us the heat index. This map was the heat index for Tuesday. Higher humidities in the east pushes that number up close to the century mark at many locations as well. Two other weather factors can also come into play when dealing with outside heat, wind and sunlight intensity. Taking these into account is best shown on a map called the wet bulb globe temperature risk. This product is an index that reaches the extreme risk category when it exceeds 90, shown by black here. It is the best indicator of when heat-related problems such as heat stroke might occur. Heat issues will persist through the weekend before a slight cooldown is expected early to mid next week. Now here's Gary with details on the moisture picture. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well, Wes did go over the temperature details that we've had recently, and those spell hot. What about precipitation? Let's take a quick look. On the drought monitor, we have a few changes that aren't in the good area. Uh, we do have a little bit more abnormally dry conditions extending from the Texas Panhandle through northwest Oklahoma up into far southern Kansas. And that connects to the other region down in southwest Oklahoma up into central Oklahoma that's suffered from moderate to severe drought over the last few months. We start out with the consecutive days with less than at least a quarter inch of rainfall across the state. We are up to now just about half a month for some areas up in the northwestern part of the state. A little bit down there in the far southwest, and a little bit up there in the Panhandle, and some up in northeastern Oklahoma. But the real danger area is there from west central up into northwest Oklahoma, where we see those 15 to 16 days without significant rainfall. Now, if we look on the Mesnet rainfall map, we can see those areas, uh, less than three inches of rainfall in several of those regions. It extends from far southwest Oklahoma up into central Oklahoma, let's say in the Canadian County, west of El Reno, but then up into northwest Oklahoma, from Arnett up to Alva into the Cherokee region. So those two regions are really the areas that have had sustained dry conditions, where some of those other areas with the green color have had a previous heavier rainfall amounts that have kept them tied over until they can get some more rainfall. When we look ahead to next week, we do see those increased odds of above normal temperatures in this outlook from the Climate Prediction Center for the western half of the state that would not help those drought conditions. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. It's been a long time since we talked about cotton and Seth Things have been pretty moist with all the rain, the, the humidity. How is that affecting cotton going forward? Yeah, so I think for Oklahoma, we'll take the moisture. Um, you know, we, we've had a pretty normal window of planting. 
Uh, we had some cotton start in, in early May in, in some parts, and we're still getting through dry land. But the, but the one thing that's been pretty consistent everywhere that cotton is this year is we've had pretty good planting moisture, and that's not something we always have. It's really hot today, yeah. but it's been very cool in the past few weeks. How has emergence been affected by these recent conditions? Yes, I mean, that's a great question. So, so emergence, you know, a lot of times we think about emergence uh, as being a factor of, you know, both temperature and moisture. So it's been warm enough around the seed for the seedlings to germinate and emerge. But then once we get that emergence, the cool conditions have really caused us to see a slowdown in growth. So cotton tends to be pretty sensitive to a lot of early season pressure. So we like to see really vigorous growth. Uh, and what we've been noticing this year, at least for most of the crop planted in May, was that we got to cotyledon cotton. So we got cotton that emerged and the, and the cotyledons uh, unfurled pretty rapidly. And then we kind of sat there. And so it took a, a longer period of time than we'd like to see for us to start putting true leaves on. And uh, one thing that I'm sure cotton producers are going to be concerned about this year are thrips. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so thrips are a, a vegetative feeding pest. They tend to favor uh, young foliage, so new growth. Um, and for cotton, we're really in a susceptible window for thrips between emergence, when those cotyledons come out, and, and four to five leaves. And as soon as we get four to five leaves, basically the plants are big enough they can carry some pressure without it really affecting their growth. This year, with us being slower to get those true leaves on, it's put us in that susceptible window for a longer period of time than we'd like to be. Um, so whether you've got cotton that has a seed treatment on it for thrips, we're having to make sprays maybe a little bit sooner or maybe uh, at a sooner growth stage than we'd like to make. And we also have cotton planted in Oklahoma with no in insecticide seed treatment that's going to address thrips. And so in those cases, we've been way more concerned because there's really nothing there to protect them. So we've had to be much more quick to pull the trigger on those insecticide sprays when we have these conditions that aren't really favoring rapid growth. And with all these cool temperatures, are we gonna see any changes with uh, the weeds this summer, anything like that? Well, I think it's a you know, combination of, of, we got the moisture to drive some growth for the crop and the weeds, and then the cool temperatures are gonna slow our growth down. And cotton's not competitive to begin with. It's already a pretty, uncompetitive crop early season. Um, so what we, we are seeing is because of the moisture and because of the cooler temperatures, we're seeing some of our residual herbicides that we might put down as a pre-emerge. Uh, I don't want to say break sooner, but there's just a lot of pressure on them with all that moisture. And Seth, you've been doing some research and you got a new fact sheet out on uh, heat units. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so we've put a recent fact sheet out on just using heat units. Uh, some ways they can be used to, to monitor growth and some other things that we can use heat units for. And, you know, relative to this current season, one of the things we talk about in the fact sheet is, you know, heat units are really reflective of, of temperature. They don't always reflect other conditions. So we have water stress or heat stress. And in this year, we've, we've had a lot of days where we get decent heat units, and we are behind on our heat units. But we've also had a lot of cloudy days, so lower sunlight. And that's driving a lot of this reduced growth we're seeing, too. So there's a lot of cotton that's probably not at the growth stage we would like for it to be based on our planting date. And so that's just something to keep in mind as we move forward. You know, you may have planted in mid-May or even in late May, and under those cooler, cloudy conditions, we may not have cotton that looks like it was planted in mid to late May by the time we get into later this month into June. All right, thank you very much, Seth. And if you'd like more information on that fact sheet that Seth mentioned, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Dr. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, is joining us now. Kim, let's dive right in and talk about how harvest is progressing. Well, it's progressing on up through the state, but not as quick as we'd like. I talked to an elevator down in southern Oklahoma. He said that it probably had 50% of the wheat in the bin right now. However, they wasn't able to start the combines till about 5 in the afternoon because of the humidity. Of course, this sun and dry weather is going to help that out. and that relatively soon, maybe this week, uh, we'll be in northern Oklahoma with that harvest. The quality on the crop looks relatively good. The test weights are all reported probably above 60 pounds. There was one uh, farmer reported 66 pound test weight. 
some uh, areas that uh, have small uh, kernels, but overall, I think it's a relatively good crop. In terms of the world's 21-22 wheat crop, how's that progressing? Another record crop. Uh, the world right now projected to produce 29.2 billion bushels. The 2021 crop was 28.5 billion bushels. That was a record. You look at any stocks, 10.9 billion bushels, just about the same as last year's uh, 10.8 billion bushels. Stocks to use ratio, even with higher production, we've got increased consumption, so that stocks to use ratio is 37.5% uh, compared to 37.6 last year, so not much change in that. I think the news is in the Black Sea area. You're looking at 4.8 billion bushel record crop there. Uh, they had 4.7 last year going back. You know, that's a lot of wheat. They're talking about the Black Sea exports increasing by about 8%. Other news is out of India. They're harvesting a record crop. India is looking at changing their marketing system, opening it up, letting companies do the exports. India is uh, proposing to become a major wheat exporter. So that could, that probably won't impact our prices this year, but in the future years, India, the number two, the number three wheat producer in the world, uh, they can make an impact on this wheat market. Let's look now at what the market is offering for wheat, corn, and beans. The wheat price is $6 a bushel. Oh, if you look back over the last five years, that's a, that's a really good price. However, you go back to mid-May, that was $7.25. We've knocked a dollar and a quarter off of that. It was $4 this time last year. You look at corn, $5.65 for a forward contract harvest delivery. That's down from six and a quarter. Uh, grain sorghum at uh, 635, that's down from 690, and soybeans at about $13, that's down from 1390. All lower, but especially wheat and corn dropping off a dollar to a dollar and a quarter. Why do you think wheat prices have declined? I think there's a lot going on in the market right now. A big part of it is our harvest is going on. The I think the crop's coming in uh, larger than expected, and it looks like it's going to go up. We got rain in, in the Dakotas and up, up into Canada that's going to improve that spring wheat crop. I think a big thing is, is what's going on in the Black Sea. They keep ra raising that production and the export potential for last year. And the money in the market, you go back to February, we had a lot of money moving into the commodity markets, buying the commodities, open interest, the number of outstanding contracts were extremely high. They've been falling. A lot of money has been moving back out of the wheat and corn markets, and I think that's impacting our prices. With that in mind, what guidance do you have for producers? A couple of weeks ago, when prices were up at that seven and a quarter, when prices were up at 650, 660, I felt relatively comfortable about pull the trigger on that wheat. It's down around six bucks. That's two dollars higher than it was last year. I think I still would sell some wheat. I probably wouldn't sell as high a percentage, but I'd pull the trigger on this market while we've got six dollar wheat. Okay, Kim, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow Calf Corner. It's that time of year when we think about summer grass management and those warm season grasses are coming on. We're joined today by Dr. Paul Beck. Paul, I appreciate you being with us. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Well, what do we need to be looking at in terms of managing those grasses? Well, this has been a really strange year. Um, May was unseasonably wet, unseasonably cool. Um, and, you know, we've had a real big jump in fertilizer prices. Sure. So there's some things that are working against us, you know, we just weren't having the warm season grasses grow at that time. And we are essentially fertilizing a whole bunch of cool season annuals and annual weeds that, you know, may have been really counterproductive for that warm season Bermuda grass. Um, whenever we have a lot of cool season growth on top of Bermuda grass, it's gonna shade it out and it's gonna slow it down even more. So, you know, we need to, you know, really look at the management of our Bermuda grass and the time when it's really going to start growing. Paul, as we think about that, it leads to several considerations. And we know that the cost of fertilizer is, has been going up and seems to continue to. Should we refertilize? Should we, what, what should we be taking a look at if we got in that situation? Well, you know, as extension specialists, one thing we always talk about is soil test. And, and providing that fertility to meet that soil test. 
And, and that'll be a way we can cut back on those fertilizer costs is by just targeting nitrogen. Uh, if we've already got enough phosphorus and potassium, we won't have to apply those. Um, if, if we've got our stocking rates on cows based on fertilized Bermuda grass, we can't quit cold turkey um, because we're going to be overstocked and overgrazing without that fertilizer. Um, one of the rules of thumb on well fertilized Bermuda grass is for every pound of nitrogen we're put out, we can get about 30 to 40 pounds of forage growth. And that can double the amount of, of uh, uh, forage growth, which would be, you know, the equivalent of doubling our stocking rate. And, you know, that may get us from about a six acre per uh, cow stocking rate on unfertilized Bermuda grass down to about three. So if we're double stocking on unfertilized Bermuda grass, we're going to impact weaning weights, we're going to imp impact uh, rebreeding rates, and uh, there's not a lot of good that can come out of it. Um, one of the rules of thumb that I use is if fertilizer is two and a half times, uh, or if calves are two and a half times the, the price of fertilizer per pound, then it's going to be uh, economical or a profitable situation. Uh, I was looking at some future market, futures markets on steers and heifers. Um, about weaning time in the fall, we're looking at a price of about a buck sixty on the average, and uh, you know that's about 2.8 times the current price of nitrogen fertilizer. So right now, as we're sitting, it's a, a, a looks to be profitable to you know use nitrogen fertilizer to drive our increased stocking rates on on a cow calf. The, uh, you know, if calves go down or fertilizer goes up, then it's, we're kind of right there on the, the borderline and we're going to have to do some adjustments in future years to either change our stocking rate or incorporate some other type of nitrogen into the system. But right now, if your stocking rate is based on fertilized Bermuda grass, you pretty much have to fertilize your Bermuda grass to, to keep, keep your uh, production going. Thank you, Paul. Thank and you, Mark. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week on Cow Calf Corner. Talking alfalfa now and the little wasp that can cause big damage to the crop's seeds. SunUp's Curtis Hare talks with our extension alfalfa specialist, Kelly Seuss. Typically, when we think about alfalfa in Oklahoma, we're re really thinking about forage. But Kelly, there's also seed production in regards to alfalfa as well. Yeah. we. We have uh, seen a decline in the last several or previous years. We've seen a decline, but in the last several years, we've seen an uptick in interest for seed production. So we wanted to throw it out there that uh, if you are interested in seed production, there's some things to keep in mind as far as insects uh, to look at when you're looking at seed production. So let's dive right into there. What, what type of insects are really going to impact seed production? Well, when we think about insects for alfalfa seed production, uh, we're really focusing on uh, it's a, the timing issue of, of, of seed production because our main insect pest in uh, seed production for alfalfa is the alfalfa seed chalcid. The, the chalcid is a t small, tiny uh, wasp, about a, a tenth of an inch, so it's not very big. Its activity in May and June, it builds, builds in population throughout the summer with its peak time being in about uh, late August through September. So the problem with this pest is it actually lays its eggs in the in the seed pods in the seed and so uh, and it does this damage from inside out and so that makes our chemical applications pretty ineffective and we, we, we just have to we just can't really control it any other way so we have to look at uh, timing and some other management strategies to be, be able to control this particular pest so we look at uh, management issues like uh, mowing the borders like we see right here, mowing the borders, uh, keeping the, the uh, volunteer down, keeping the habitat down for the potential increase of this particular pest throughout the summer as much as possible. Then the, the main thing we look at is harvest timing. When we look at harvest timing for alfalfa seed, we, we're looking at about a 10 week window. We, we, we typically harvest in May, our first harvest is in May. And then our new growth for the second crop usually comes on about uh, and starts flowering about mid-June. So that's the point where we start, we just leave the crop and the pollination begins. And so pollination starts or keeps on going through about uh, the, the mid to late June. Seed sets early uh, July and then it dries, matures, 
and we're ready for harvest around the first part of August. And so that gives us a time frame to harvest before the, the highest populations of Chalcid begins. It, the problem is if we wait and, and har or try to harvest a little bit too early, we run the risk of not having enough pollinators out here to, to, to do their job and, and help us get the seed set. Again, if we wait too late, we run the risk of having a high population of uh, chalcids when we try to harvest. And if that is the case, we can lose as much as 80 or more percent of the crop. Wow. So, so, so we, it, timing is really crucial for this particular pest. Is there other insects that can also impact the alfalfa as well? During this time frame, we're really concerned about, during, during this uh, pollination time frame about mid-June, we're really concerned about grasshoppers and also plant bugs under the genus Ligus. Uh, both of them really like flowering structures and, and the flower and can really do some significant damage if uh, they, they feed on those structures and cause leaf drop, uh, uh, flower drop, leaf drop, and can really do some significant damage during this time frame if we don't get them under control. Now is the key time to be able to control them before they get too big and, and get more mobile and harder to control. Uh, the thing about, thing about that is we've talked about forage uh, alfalfa a while ago. The threshold in forage alfalfa is about, we, we kind of walk the borders of the field and we, if we see about 15 to 20 uh, hoppers flying up, that's a good threshold number, uh, kind of an estimate. But for seed production, it's, it's about half that or less. And you also have a fact sheet that people can go to to, to yeah, we have Yeah, we have a fact sheet uh, uh, managing insect pests in alfalfa, uh, uh, I think it's current report 7150. EPP 7150. All right, thanks, Kelly. Kelly Seuss, Extension Alfalfa Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like a link to the fact sheet Kelly mentioned, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. We wish you the best of luck with wheat harvest, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.